My guest today is Mariette Di Cristina. Mariette is a colleague here at Boston University. She is the Dean of our College of Communication. She is the former Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, a past president of the National Association of Science Writers. And I want to ask her what she thinks the future of science journalism might look like in a post-COVID world. You know, one thing I think that pandemic has taught us all is the very real need, or maybe it's emphasized for us all, the very real need for reliable, trustworthy scientific information. There's been such a flood of information, some of it reliable, some of it really not, some of it on purpose not, that the WHO in February declared that we are, in addition to suffering from a pandemic, suffering from an infodemic. At the same time, Economic conditions from the pandemic have really worsened things and accelerated the continued collapse of many parts of the, especially the local journalism industries, um, and especially among specialist reporters such as science journalists, whose jobs had, had vanished, uh, full-time jobs at least, earlier. With a big story like coronavirus, we're all on that beat. So reporters who in the past might have covered sports or education are now pulled onto uh, the coronavirus beat. And science coverage in the first place was always complicated, uh, especially with an evolving story like with coronavirus and difficult to begin with. So with coronavirus, we have something of a perfect storm, you know, a fast changing story, reporters in shorter supply, and the ones that are were at first in quarantine, so couldn't put uh, boots on the ground and also not necessarily experienced with science and medical coverage. So they're getting, and, they're, and those reporters are getting hit with disinformation and cyber attacks as well. And last and not least, most people these days are getting their news from social media platforms, including their science news. Those platforms and the algorithms that they use seek to put new things that are different uh, out ahead of other things. So in effect, that puts a megaphone on some of humanity's foibles, including spreading things like conspiracy theories, false cures, emphasizing social divisions based on identity and putting us in uh, little media bubbles of people who agree with us, which further emphasizes those social divisions. When we're uncertain and anxious, we naturally look for more information. And when we feel that, that uncertainty, that, again, gives us greater exposure to clickbait, conspiracy theories, hyperpartisanism, pseudoscience, and false news. So all of these are, are creating a difficult ecosystem for scientific reporting. How might you grade the science journalism that is happening in this moment of COVID? I think what we're seeing in real time, and this applies to science journalists, but, but also to the broader journalism community as well, is a profession that is in public and very visibly changing the way it works. Uh, we saw that in science journalism, you mentioned climate uh, a bit earlier, I remember, uh, especially with less experienced science reporters, there was this false this habit of what we you know, call false equivalence, where you comes from political reporting, where you might be covering all sides, but we all know in science, you know, there aren't all sides. There might be 98% of researchers who agree on one thing and 2% who feel another way. And those 2% do not deserve equal time because we're talking about facts here and things that have a lot of evidence behind them, as opposed to opinions, which is very different. Grading-wise, uh, very interesting that you asked this. One of our professors, uh, Lei Guo, at the College of Communication, has just come out with a study about how media have, as I mentioned, changing in real time, how the reporting changed from early in the coronavirus to now. And you can see the reporters kind of gaining a level of understanding of this. Remember, at first it was very new. We didn't know a lot about it. Should we wear masks? Should we not? And some of the other things I've seen us start to do is when there's a false claim, for instance, and it needs to be debunked, early on reporters would sort of repeat the false claim and then debunk it. The challenge there is the first thing you see sticks in your memory. What do you think will be the impact of this moment on the future of science journalism? Will we see more interest in science journalism or might we see more science in all journalism? And on the one hand, we can say that more people are reading science stories than ever. All kinds of science stories. Some of them, indeed, are straight from the journals themselves where they're publishing uh, research data. I do think that people have, the national conversation, the international conversation around journalism has begun to shift 
to an appreciation for it, and especially one for reliable you know, information. In fact, the other day I was driving in my car and I heard some uh, radio announcers doing their morning news bit. And while they were reading the headlines, they said, you know, I really hope that the reporters and the journalists are going to be okay and doing okay. And, um, you know, they're so important for our future and for our democracy and for our understanding about the world. And I have to say that's I'm starting to hear that language a lot more often of appreciation for quality uh, reporting, quality science reporting and other reporting. So I, I think there is, there is some of that. By the same token, we have some other forces at work, you know, mentioning social media and so on, that have the effect of drowning out some of those expert voices. So it's going to be a bit of a tussle for a while yet, as far as I can see.